we see Moses being called at the burning bush. Um, at this time, he was only a shepherd. And, and Moses resisted the call at first, but then he relents and accepts the call of God, and he leads the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. So then in Leviticus, God instructs Moses on the laws, the worship instructions. There were very detailed instructions given how they were to worship and, and all the different types of offerings they were, they were to present to the Lord. And <clears throat> Moses was being worn down by the people's constant complaining and rebelling about one thing or another. So here's the complaint in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, 13 to 17. Moses is saying to God, where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. Realize that there were 600 plus men of military age plus women and children, so they're probably a million and a half, maybe as many as three million people he's talking about there. And verse 15, if this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, bring me, or, or do not let me face my own ruin. This is, he's, in, he's desperate. The only help he has is um, Aaron, his brother, and Joshua, the son of Nun, who was always there. And Joshua was a scribe and probably wrote these words down as, as they came to Moses. But the Lord answered in verse 16, the Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on them. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. So here's Moses in this desperation, and um, he's, 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 if God won't do something about it, then Moses wants to be done with it. He wants God to take him. He said, I had enough of these people. So if we go to verse 24, so Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. Now when it says he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on Moses, that doesn't mean he removed some of the Spirit from Moses. There, the Spirit doesn't have a quantity. He just took of the Spirit that was on Moses, that Spirit, the Holy Spirit that we know, and put it on to the 70 elders. And they prophesied, but they didn't do it again. However, it says in verse 26, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. Now these two men were supposed to be uh, two of the 70 that Moses chose to go and meet with God at the tent, but they didn't do that. They remained in the camp. Continuing, it says, they were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet, the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. Verse 27, a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. In verse 29, but Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. 
So what was the burden? His complaint. They keep wailing. I cannot carry these people by myself. The Israelites had rebelled at the mountain of God. They promised we will obey the Lord. Then, then, they, then Moses went up to get the law. He was up there for 40 days. And they said, we don't know what happened to him. And they clamored and demanded that Aaron make them gods. So they gave their gold earrings and and uh, and Moses fashioned for them, not Moses, Aaron fashioned for them a golden calf and they started to worship it. And they were engaged in revelry around that golden calf when Moses came down. And they were always rebelling and doing things like that. Even Aaron liked him. He says, what is this golden calf? He said, well, I put their earrings in the fire and out came this calf. But he actually made the calf. So in a way, Moses was really by himself as far as a servant of the Lord. So then they complained about the lack of water and the lack of food. And now they were demanding meat. Moses wanted to die. Everything seemed to be going wrong. He's only a man. He was only a shepherd. He didn't take the role of a leader for himself. He accepted the role. He hadn't chosen it. Some people are, they want to be leaders. They, they go to school and study things and want to be leaders. Others just accept the leadership role. And myself, I didn't want to be a leader. I didn't want to be a pastor. I accepted, I accepted the calling. So I can understand that. But everything he did successfully was done with God's help. As the leader, Moses couldn't control these people. Some of them were rebellious, repeatedly rebellious. And Moses was responsible for two to three million people. That was an entire nation that came out of another nation. Stiff-necked people, in God's words, he said, I see these stiff-necked people. Get away from them, I'm going to destroy them. And I will make you into a great nation. And God talked him out of that. The difficulty of managing all these people was way too much for only one man. He was so desperate that he wanted to die. He had enough. I can't do this anymore. Bring me home. So, Point number two is God's compassion. God cares about the leaders that he appoints. God's leaders don't always have an easy path to walk. Satan didn't want Moses to succeed. He didn't want the will of God to be followed, Satan did. He, he didn't want to, there to be a nation of Israel. He didn't want that nation to exist. Who inspires today nations that don't want Israel to exist? Satan. The Messiah would come from that nation. The Messiah would be Satan's nemesis. So Satan was there stirring up these people and trying to get Moses to be in despair. Anyone who does the will of God faces opposition. Moses faced opposition. To us, the opposition looks like it came from the people. But who or what causes the people to be in rebellion? Whatever, whatever wherever God is moving, the enemy is trying to ruin the work that God's people, those who do his bidding, um, who always have God's presence with them, and Satan is trying to destroy that. Sometimes we don't know that he's there. And when I say Satan, I don't mean him. He was probably personally involved here. But with us, he had just assigns demons. I'm sure of that, because Satan is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere present like God is. But he has his agents 
all over. But we have assurance that that he that that he is there, and we have insurance that God is there with us. If you're in God's will and you're doing His bidding, you will face times when it seems like you're alone in the ministry. You are not alone. The enemy wants you to think that. The enemy's there too. God's love and compassion are always with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus said. Sometimes we get into a dark place. We do. Moses was in a dark place here. He wanted to be dead. Can't get into a more dark place than that. God's compassion came to him with a solution. God always has a plan. So God's plan was revealed in verse 16 and 17. He said, bring 70 elders known to you to be leaders and officials. So there were certain qualifications. Three of them spelled out right there. First one was bring 70 that are known to you. He was to choose these people who would assist him. Moses didn't know all 630,000 men plus women and children. He was to choose 70 elders, people that he knew. People that he knew. Secondly, they were to be leaders, known leaders. Moses was to choose assistants that he knew would have leadership qualities. Some are born leaders. Some develop leadership qualities. Some are equipped by God to be leaders. Some are leaders that shouldn't be. <laughs> you don't have to look very far to see leaders that don't have the interest of the people at heart. So Moses was to search for leaders that would cooperate with him in leading the people to the land that God promised. They would also help him with discipline and making sure that the people knew what God required. So it was a big job for each of these 70 to do that. And the third requirement is that they be officials. They were already officials, probably, um, probably leaders of the clans that they were in. So he would choose his assistance from those who were leaders in their own clans. They would be respected. Uh, they would already have some standing among the people. Those are the three qualifications. The fourth point is that they prophesied in verse 25, God took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him, that is on Moses, and put it on the 70 elders. As a sign, they prophesied. I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know what that was. I'm not, ex I'm not able to find out what that was. Um... Apparently, they were uttering something. They were saying something. Prophecy is a declaration, an utterance, inspired by the Holy Spirit that has something to do with what will happen, with something that's going to happen. In the church, if the utterance is about something that's currently happening, we call that a word of knowledge. You know, if I, you know, I believe somebody hears a is depressed, or I believe somebody here has a terrible headache. That's a word of knowledge. God gives you that knowledge to know that you're going to pray for that person. But prophecy in our understanding of the word has something to do with an event that hasn't happened yet. Could it be that this prophesying, what they're called prophesying, what's translated that way from the Hebrew, is the same thing that happened with Saul in the, in the Jamuel, in in, chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, it says this, they will greet you, this is, this is Samuel telling Saul what's going to happen. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. 
After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will be, and you will prophesy with them, and you'll be changed into a different person. So in our thinking of what prophecy is, it seems not the same as what's going on, because what they're doing is accompanied by musical instruments, and they're all doing it at the same time. And then Saul was doing it with them. And it says in verse 9, as Saul, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all the signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish, is Saul, also among the prophets. So I don't really know, understand what they were doing that's referred to as prophecy. If they're all giving a prophecy about what's going to happen, all at the same time and all together, it would, be, it would be bedlam. It wouldn't be a recorded prophecy that, uh, well, I just don't understand what it is. I don't, I don't know what it is. But they're calling it prophecy. It happened as the Holy Spirit came on them in the seven, case of the 70 elders. And they didn't do it again. It sounds more like uh, what happened, you know, in, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. It sounds more like, more like maybe they were just praising God. Prophecy is described as a message from God. I don't know exactly what that was, what that they were doing. And the scripture doesn't say. There are different opinions uh, among commentators, but none of them uh, answers the question. But whatever it was, it was a confirmation that God was with them, that the Spirit was on them, that it even specif specifies that the Spirit was on Saul, but on these back to these 70 um, officials who were selected to be Moses' uh, assistants, um, the Spirit was on them. God, it said God take the Spirit and puts it on them and they prophesied, but they never did it again. So Eldad and Medad, they were part of the 70. They were two of the 70 that were chosen by Moses. Why didn't they go to the tent? They were supposed to go to the tent. Why didn't they? We don't know. It doesn't say. Maybe they didn't see themselves as worthy to be among those chosen. Maybe they had duties in the camp that couldn't be accomplished quickly enough to get away. Maybe like Moses, they didn't feel adequate for the task. But these two also had a visitation of the Holy Spirit with the same utterances as the other 68. God isn't limited to a particular location. God isn't limited to the attitudes of the people that are chosen. God isn't limited by anything. But Moses was authorized to choose those who would help him. God honored his choices by applying the Holy Spirit even to those two who didn't come to the tent. God isn't limited to a tent, a building, a cloud, or a pillar of, of fire. God is sovereign in all things. God isn't limited to our expectations. We tend to think that our expectations, you know, are, are that important, but he isn't limited to anything. Matthew Henry's comment is, but the Spirit of God found them in the camp and, where they, and there they exercised their gift of praying, preaching, and praising God. 
they spake as moved by the Holy Ghost. He's referring to it praying, preaching, and praising God, declaring the glory of God, declaring the awesomeness of God. That's how Matthew, Matthew Henry is describing what they were doing. And then there was this young man. Whatever the spirit led utterance was, it was heard. It was heard among the 68 around the tent of meeting. It was heard among them and among the people who could hear what was going on there. And the utterance was heard by those also in the camp near where Eldad and Medad were. And this young man heard this unusual utterance. And it wasn't a typical utterance. It wasn't a typical thing that would come out of someone's mouth. It came out of their mouth prompted by the Holy Spirit that came onto them. And this young man ran to tell Moses about it. The young man was no doubt part of the clan of Eldad and Medad because in the camp their divisions were separated. They each had a banner. And so he was probably in that clan where they camped. And what they heard was so unusual as to be alarming. So alarming that they that he uh, felt bound to alert Moses. He ran. He probably had seen the destruction that God had brought on those who had been rebellious. And in his youth, maybe he thought that these two were somehow in rebellion. He didn't, he wasn't privy to what God had instructed Moses to do. And then there's Joshua. Now Joshua may have been one of those 70. There's a good chance that he would have been one of the 70. He certainly seems to be qualified. Uh, Joshua urged, urged Moses to stop them from, here's the word again, from prophesying, whatever sort of utterance that was. It was special. It was Holy Ghost inspired, whatever it was. Joshua probably was alarmed. He, he may have thought that the Spirit would only come onto those 68 who cooperated and came to the tent of meeting. He may have thought that they were in rebellion, those two, Eldad and Medad. He may have thought God would bring judgment because of it. So he was alarmed. That's, that's his response. Moses' response is in verse 29. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So number one, Moses reprimanded Joshua. We don't know what happened to Eldad and Medad. We don't know what happened to the young man. But Eldad and Medad became part of the 70. And secondly, Moses wishes that all the Lord's people would have the Spirit of God on them. If it were so, he wouldn't have to confront so much rebellion. If the Spirit was on all God's people, then they wouldn't be rebelling because they did that out of their own self-interest and concerns. The answer is in Exodus chapter 33, verse 12 to 14, which actually comes before this in Numbers, but Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found and you have found favor with me. Verse 13. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So God had promised that he would give Moses rest because of his holy presence. You can get in to God's presence and get rest. When we're terrified about something, when we're upset about something, when we're fussing about something, when we're riled up about something, you can go into God. They couldn't do that. Before Acts chapter 2, they couldn't do that. But you can go into God's presence. 
into the presence of the Holy Spirit and get rest. Amen. You can. So, the other 68 were in, God, were in God's favor. Eldad and Medad were in God's favor. They were all in God's favor. The Holy Spirit came unto all 70 of them. They all prophesied, whatever that was. I don't know what it was. God's promise to Moses was accomplished. God was with him, and God gave him rest. Sometimes you just need to rest directly from God. Sometimes he calls someone to come alongside of you. A prayer partner, a person that you can call. So in this case, he set up a system where there were 70 people that would help him, and that rested him. Many so-called denominations preach the word. There are people who get saved in other churches than our own churches. We call ourselves Pentecostal. That's just a label. But the word is there. The word is there in so many of those churches that we think it's not, but it is. Any church that has the Bible as its core can get people saved. We can be like the young man and like Joshua, thinking that, thinking that our way is the only way. And I think that kind of thinking used to, used to be more common in, in Pentecostal circles. But some churches have a lot of formalism. They call it liturgy. And liturgy and vestiture, you know, where the, where the flowing things they call vestments, uh, they veil the gospel. They veil it. But they don't render it effective. You see what I'm saying? They veil the gospel. The, all the pomp and circumstance of some denominations distracts from the gospel. But the gospel is still there. It's still there. God will have his way. The Holy Spirit will accompany the word. So if somebody's in a Lutheran church or Presbyterian church, or they get in the Bible, the word does not return void. Amen. Even though the church itself may not lead them to salvation, they can get saved in there anyway. My mom grew up in a Lutheran church. My brother and I, two summers ago, whatever summer was before the, before the, uh, before the pandemic hit, we visited that church, not, as a, not in a service. We talked to the secretary, and she came down and met us there to unlock the church. I wanted to go and see where my mother grew up in a church. And it was a beautiful sanctuary, gorgeous. Oak, oak fancy pulpit that you had to step up into. We went down in the basement and saw where the Sunday school was. My mother was probably learned about Jesus in that basement. I just wanted to see that. I wanted to be in that space. I have a nostalgia about me like that. I wanted to be where she was. Because we were never, my mom used to point to that. Over there is the church we went to. She used to point to that. On the way to uncle, her uncle uh, Albert's house. But anyway, so I, I just wanted to go there. But she was the most devout, God-loving, born-again person imaginable. There are born-again believers in the Catholic Church. I remember going in to photograph uh, weddings. There's a particular Catholic Church in Peoria. You could feel the Spirit of God in that church. And there was a charismatic priest in that church. You can feel the Spirit of God in there. I've known born-again Presbyterians. But we don't think of that church as one who promotes the born-again experience. But that's maybe a faulty thinking of ours. I once examined the doctrine of the Anglican Church. Yep, salvation is spelled right out in their doctrine. Well, we 
we don't think of the Church of England, the Ang Anglican Church, as being one that's what we call fundamentalist. You see what I'm saying? We don't think of it that way. But it is that way. People in the fundamentalist churches tend to think that they're the only ones who carry the gospel. And we fundamentalists, and that's what we are basically, probably carry it most effectively because we know that's our purpose. But we shouldn't be like the young man. We shouldn't be like Joshua. And let's not look at other denominations and think that we're superior to them because we're Pentecostal. Let's not look down on our faith. People do get saved in other churches. Methodism came about in Britain as a sort of a return to basics, a return to the Bible, a turning away from the excesses of the official church. The church had become more about the church than about the gospel, but the doctrine is still there. Seekers after God will be found by him. People that seek God, no matter what teaching they're under, they will find God if they seek him. <coughs> the doctrine's still there. The gospel first came to Phillipsburg with the Lutheran minister. Did you know that? That's true. Then a circuit-riding preacher came through here, part of his circuit, and he was... He was a Methodist preacher. Methodism uh, was one of the great uh, fires of, of revivalism that came in so many parts of the world. The Methodist church carried <coughs> salvation. I mean, it, it was powerful. And then the holiness movement came from Methodism. In the holiness movement, they were thinking that... Uh, that there was a second work of grace in which God would enable them to live a perfect holy life. We still have holiness movements with us. And the Pentecostal movement came out from the holiness movement where they, where they were looking and seeking that the things that happened in the book of Acts and the Bible could be still relevant today. And that's where, that's where we come from. But today's churches have too many walls around them. We're this and you're that. But we're, we all, we're all believers. There's plenty of sinners to go around, amen? amen? We have walls and labels. We're this and we're that. How about we're Christian? We're born again Christian believers. And we want you to be too. How about that? Amen. The 70 were all chosen. El dead and me dead. For some reason, they couldn't be there, so God anointed them for service right where they were. They didn't accompany the other 68, but they were with them anyway. They were with them in the spirit. The young man and Joshua didn't respect that they could be thus blessed by God in another place. They didn't understand. But Moses, in his response, Moses had it right. He wished that all God's people would have the Holy Spirit. Of course, there are some fellowships that are cultish and are away from the will of God and way off from the Scripture, and those are to be avoided. But let's not be quick to put walls around our own fellowship. There are churches that are embracing sin. They're carrying a counterfeit gospel. Have nothing to do with them. You know what I'm talking about? They have, they have openly gay bishops and openly gay ministers and they're embracing sin. Yeah. Those are churches you have to come out of. And there are some the border on idolatry. Um, I don't want to be specific, but people get saved in, a, in that church. They do. I know them. I've seen them. I, think I know them personally. So, we, we, it's so easy for us to put labels on everything and build a fortress around our own fellowship. 
and say, this is us and that's you. Well, we we got to get away from that. we got to tear some of these walls down. And we'll be more effective because there's churches that don't look like us or sound like us or worship like us, but they still carry the gospel. Their core is the Bible. And they're, they're our brothers and sisters. So the bottom line is this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 to 17. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or Belial, however you pronounce that. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. So the dividing thing between what we call Christendom is not the labels on the church, but it's the what they base their beliefs on. If they're fundamentalists, believe in salvation, believe in the Bible, and that's their core, then they're doing the same purpose that we are, just as Eldad and Medad are doing the same purpose as the other 68. But I know, you know, we tend to, to look at other denominations and think, well, they don't accomplish anything for God. Well, we could be wrong about that. <laughs> I've known, I've known born-again Presbyterians, and they love the Lord, and they love their style of worship, and they're not, you know, they're not, they're not a fellowship of darkness, they're not wickedness. I think we need to have a new way of looking at some things. Don't you know what I mean? A new way of looking at believers in other churches and other denominations. There are some that are cults. There are some that do not, will not say that Jesus is God. And they will come to your door and want to have a Bible study with you. And I said to the two that came to my door, I don't know, maybe six or eight months ago, I said, do you believe in the Trinity? No. So you're Jehovah's Witnesses. They said, yes. I said, we don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> but there are those that are way, way out of, way out of, way off away from the Bible in their doctrine. And those are cults. But I think I just think we need to, to tear down some walls and maybe work it together. We could do more things for God. You know what I'm saying? So let's not criticize El Dad and Me Dad like the young man and like Joshua did. Let's not, you know, let's not, let's not get alarmed when, when people in other churches get the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let's not get alarmed and say, well, how can you stay in that church and have the baptism in the Holy Spirit? You're, you're gonna be a Joshua or the young man, but El Dad and Me Dad had a ministry and those people have a ministry if they get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or even the salvation experience. They're going to they're gonna pass that on because it's attractive. <laughs> salvation is attractive. Some people, including myself, put your hand out, I don't want to hear it. I don't want anything about that. But eventually, the Holy Spirit will, will wear you down. And you'll say, oh, instead of this, it'll go like this. That's an awesome moment. That's an awesome moment in a person's life, amen? Mm -hmm. Would you stand? Mm -hmm. Don't forget to take, uh, take a box of food, take a couple of them, uh, take an extra one to give to somebody you know that may be struggling to get enough food these days. Dear Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the believers in the, in the house here today, Lord. And I thank you that we have a that we have a Savior that loves us, that cared for us so much that he laid down his life for us, Lord. I thank you that, that you did that. 
and of your heart of love for us, Lord. Do we accept the challenge to carry that gospel, to carry that light into dark places? We accept it, Lord. And uh, if you will, if you will, well, I know that you will bless us, Lord, in that undertaking. I know that you will, because that's what you do, Lord. So bless these people. Give them all, Lord, give them all uh, a rested day. And uh, bring challenges to us, Lord. Um, bring us sinners. Bring us sinners into our circle of influence personally and also into the church <coughs> so that we can bring light into their dark lives, Lord. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>